today I'd like to achieve three results. One is to briefly review what we've done up till now. Then uh, talk about some circuit changes that I think will improve this uh, radio and put those changes in. And then finally talk about where we're going to go uh, next. Now, so far, what we have done is we have put in a new power cord, one with a polarized plug, that is one in which one side of the plug is wider than the other side so that it will only go into the outlet one way. And this side, the, the wide spade side, is the neutral side. So we have wired that to the switch which goes to the chassis or actually to the B minus and then there's a resistive network if you've watched the previous videos you know about all of this. When we put the cord in we made sure to tie it to secure it so that if someone pulls hard on the cord it won't come ripping out of the back of the radio. Another thing we've done is put a uh, fuse in and we'll talk about that uh, more in a second and then we have gone through and replaced all of the the paper capacitors and we've also replaced in this case all the electrolytics we'll talk a little more about that in a second too uh, then w a few resistors like this one we have changed because they were uh, way out of tolerance so uh, I said I would talk a little more about the capacitors. Let's briefly talk about replacing capacitors. And this is my take on this. And it hasn't always been this way. If you look at some of my earlier videos, you'll see that I used to uh, do it a different way and, and so on. And I'm not saying those were wrong either. Uh, lots of people have different ideas. so. This is just where, where I stand today on replacing capacitors in tube circuits. First, I recommend you always get a schematic. And uh, often you can download those. There's a whole lot of uh, writer's manuals on the American Radio History uh, site. And the Boat Anchor Manual site, I think it's, it's called Edibris, E-D-I-B-R-I-S. Uh, but if you just put in Bama or Boat Anchor Manuals into Google, it'll find it. And this is more for uh, vintage uh, tube equipment and test equipment and so on. The second thing that I suggest you do is get or make a parts list. Now, sometimes there's a parts list that comes with the literature on the radio or whatever you're working on. But whether it has one or not, Go ahead and make sure you have a parts list so you'll know what parts to get. Then find your replacement capacitors. Test all of them for value and leakage. Now, if this were a transistor circuit, instead of leakage, I would test for ESR here. But in these old tube circuits, the two things you want to make sure that the new capacitors will uh, are within tolerance is that they have a very low leakage and that they're the right value. Now, you have to answer a question with electrolytics, whether you're going to reform them or replace them. This is partly a question of what you're working on and what you plan to do with it. So I'm not going to go into any more of that. I did do a video on electrolytic capacitors some time ago that you might want to look at, and there are many other sources of information. With regard to the paper capacitors, my advice is to replace them all. And in doing so, identify the outside foil, and you, you uh, may recall some of the earlier videos in which we talked about this, so that you can then replace these paper capacitors one at a time. Why do I suggest one at a time? Because until you have a lot of experience, you're better off doing one capacitor at a time. So you can remember exactly where it goes, exactly which end uh, you want the outside foil, or in the case of electrolytics, the, the positive and negative, and then verify that replacement. So basically, you go through this cycle uh, of 
identifying the outside foil, replace the capacitor, verify that it's correct, and so on until you've done all of the paper capacitors. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the voltage readings that we took in this receiver in the last and what I have done here is circled in red the ones that I consider relevant at the top is the radio that we're working on the uh, RC1024. Now at the bottom are the voltages that come out of the radio that is used as an example in the All-American 5 book by Richard McWhorter. He uses an RC1079, which is a, about a two or three year later receiver than the one we're working on, both made by RCA. So what I did is I compared the readings to what I expected to get and I circled some of them and we'll talk about those when we get to the circuit itself. But for now, these are the uh, uh, most important readings. Basically what I mean is these are the cathode grid and plate and if there's more than one grid, it's the multiple grids. So for example, on the SQ7, there are a couple of, of diode plates that are used for the AVC and the detector. And then there is a grid cathode and plate that is, that is used for audio amplification and so on. Once again, we'll talk more about the circuit at a, at a future point. So these are the values that I read in the 1024. Basically, I didn't see anything in these readings that caused me any uh, great concern. But one of the things we're going to do next is turn on the radio and see if it actually works. I've plugged the radio into the isolation transformer and I've set the uh, voltage to about 117 volts. And you notice on the meter over here a, a little bit of current being drawn. As we talked about in some previous uh, episodes, the dial light has now come to full brightness. So that means that the tubes are drawing current. So now for the uh, moment of truth. Now I'll be honest with you, I've already tried this radio, uh, but uh, this will be the first time that we'll get a chance to see whether this radio is actually going to work now that we've replaced all these parts. Okay, well, I apologize if, uh, if you're offended by the material on the radio. Uh, it doesn't seem to be much on uh, AM these days except talk radio, so I don't know whether you're a fan of that or not. At any rate, the radio works. So the next things that I'm going to be doing are some circuit changes. Let me tell you specifically what we're going to do. First thing we're going to do is we're going to rewire the radio so that the switch, instead of switching the neutral like it does now, switches the hot line, the hot side. The second thing we're going to do is we are going to replace one of the capacitors with a safety capacitor. The, if you remember, there is a network. Let me show you again what we're talking about. <clears throat> It's this network right here that consists of a 220K resistor and a 0.1 mic capacitor that goes between B minus, which we call ground, and the chassis. This, this little uh, rake symbol always means the chassis. This capacitor I put in the uh, using just a regular film capacitor. We're now going to replace that with a safety capacitor and the reason we do that is we want a capacitor that is guaranteed to fail open. We don't want, if this one ever shorts, we don't want a connection between the uh, B minus, which remember is the, is the neutral of the power line now, 
But in case somebody somehow gets power onto that neutral line, we don't want it feeding through to the chassis through this, uh, this capacitor. So we're going to replace that. We'll look at that in, in just a second. But the third thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be putting a, a, another bypass capacitor across this 50 microfarad. The reason I'm doing that is this is the B plus line that feeds the detector, the, R, the uh, first audio frequency amplifier, also the IF stage. Let me tilt it up a little here. The IF amplifier and also supplies B plus and screen voltage to the detector oscillator. So we want to make sure that this line is thoroughly bypassed. And the reason we want to replace this or bypass this 50 microfarad is here is a chart that comes out of a manual or a uh, data sheet on the Rubicon website. What it shows is that at lower frequencies, the capacitive reactance of a capacitor dominates, as they say in the, in the mid-range, the ESR dominates, but we're not going to worry about that. But the big thing is that as the capacitor goes, as the frequency goes up, the inductance of the capacitor starts to uh, have an effect on the bypassing. And this is particularly pronounced with electrolytics. In other words, the frequency at which an electrolytics uh, bypassing ability starts to go back up is much lower. So what we're going to do is use a good RF capacitor across the electrolytic. In other words, across this 50 microfarad. Now, in general, we could do the same thing here, but you'll notice there already is a 0.05 across it, uh, effectively across this uh, capacitor. And besides, this uh, B plus voltage here only feeds the audio output. It's less likely to be a problem, but this line here needs to be bypassed, in my opinion. Now, I've saved all of these circuit changes to, to one video, so they'd all be here together. So let me get those put in, and then we'll come back and see how the radio works after we put in all those uh, changes. So the first change we're going to be making is to remove this yellow wire and move this into the power cord, which is the neutral, to the place that the yellow wire used to connect. That effectively, rem or that actually, removes the uh, power switch from the circuit. Uh, let me show you on the schematic what we're doing. Here is the power switch. Right now the neutral is connected to this end and the yellow wire is connected to B minus. So what we're going to do is remove the yellow wire and connect this wire directly to B minus. So let's do that. And that's been done. You'll notice that the wire from the uh, power cord is now connected down here. The yellow wire that used to go up here is removed and of course this was moved from this point to, to B minus. Now if you plug the radio in it would come on automatically because there is no on-off switch anymore. The next thing that we're going to do is put the on-off switch in series with the hot line. Now if you remember we put a fuse in the hot line which connects down here. So the next thing we're going to do is remove that wire and connect this to one end of the power switch. Then we're going to connect the other end of the power switch to the place this used to come from. That will insert the power switch in the hot side instead of in the neutral side. Okay, you'll notice 
that what I have done is I've brought the other end of the power cord, which is connected to the fuse, down and connected it to this end of the uh, on-off switch. And then the other end of the on-off switch is connected through that yellow wire back to the point where the uh, hot lead used to connect. So now let's see if the radio turns on. The uh, pilot light came on. And we're going to wait till the pilot light comes up to full brightness. Starting to do that now. And then we'll turn up the volume. So in many ways what this is saying is that we represent the obstacle, the final obstacle, if you will, to the desire these people have. Okay. And we will turn it off. So why did we do that? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to turn this off and unplug it. I never touch a chassis that's plugged in unless I absolutely have to. And in those cases, I make sure that I'm doing so in a safe manner. Uh, in other words, respect electricity and it'll leave you alone. <laughs> if you don't respect it, it'll bite you and it'll bite you bad. And, and Believe it or not, I, I've been bitten pretty badly over the years, but not for the last 20 or 30 years because I do learn from my mistakes. Okay, so why did we change that? Well, now this on-off switch is in the same hot lead as the, the fuse. We've done that so that even if the radio is turned off, there is no way for current to come through the hot lead and get to the chassis because the on-off switch is now in the hot lead. So I'm going to uh, write that in on this schematic as well. And then the next thing we're going to be doing is changing this capacitor, this 0.1 mic capacitor. Now, uh, that capacitor is right here. The uh, It's this point one mic that goes from uh, this point to chassis. I'm not going to put the replacement there. I'm going to put the replacement from here to the end of this resistor. This is the 220K resistor. And I want it to bypass the resistor. This lead goes directly to ground. It's a much shorter path from here to here. And that will provide an effective RF bypass. And the capacitor that I'm going to be using is a safety capacitor. Here is what one of those looks like. You may or may not be able to read the writing on it. It looks like the camera is having a little trouble focusing. The uh, These are special capacitors that are designed to fail open. If, if they ever begin to draw excessive current for any reason, they basically open like a fuse, guaranteeing that they do not short the AC line to something that it shouldn't be connected to. Now this particular capacitor is called an X, XY capacitor. What that means is it can be connected across the AC line, that's what the X means, and the XY means it can be connected across or from one lead to ground. So if you have a three-phase circuit, for example, you can connect from one lead of the three phase to the green wire with these same capacitors. They're rated for uh, for that kind of, uh, of use. They're a little more expensive, but they're well worth it for the peace of mind they give you that your radio is never going to uh, have a capacitor failure that's going to make it dangerous. So let's stick this in. Okay, we've got the capacitor in. 
And those of you with sharp eyes may have noticed that this is not a 0.1 microfarad. This is a 0.01 microfarad. And that's deliberate. It's uh, a 0.1 mic, which is what I took out of there and what was in the original radio. Let's see if we can get it to focus. Come on, camera. Well, at any rate, the uh, it will pass too much AC at 60 cycles. So what we do is we reduce the size of this capacitor by 10, a factor of 10. We go from a 0.1 mic to a 0.01 mic. And you think, well, that might affect the circuit. Remember, the purpose of this capacitor is to provide a, an RF path to ground for the RF in the circuit to pass to the chassis so that the chassis can serve as an RF shield. It's not intended to pass 60 cycle, so you don't want too big a capacitor there. You want one just big enough to do the effective job of allowing the chassis to provide a shield without conducting very much AC to the chassis. Now, the way we re rewired this chassis, there's no voltage really on there because remember the B minus now is connected to neutral. So this capacitor has no AC voltage across it in normal operation. But if something should go wrong at some point in the, in the future, we are guaranteed that A, this capacitor won't pass too much AC, and B, if it, uh, something happens to the capacitor, it will fail open. All right, the last thing we want to do is replace, or I'm sorry, is to add a an RF bypass capacitor across the 50 microfarad. Now, the 50 microfarad is hard to see in here. It's right down there. So I'm going to insert this in there, and then we'll do a final test on the radio. So here's the radio turned back up the right way, and uh, let's check and see if it's still working. There are some metrics that eventually, if you have 115 quarter yep. rating, even Duley, who's a very the uh, <laughs> I changed the station selection, so uh, went from. Uh, from political talk to, to sports talk. Uh, but basically the idea is we have now finished restoring this radio. It can obviously use some additional work. It can, uh, for example, we could clean it up a little bit better, etc. I'm going to leave it pretty much in its original condition. I will tell you that I have benefited from the work of my wife in cleaning up this uh, case. It, she really did a wonderful job. I didn't think that paint was going to come off, but uh, she probably spent as much time cleaning this case as I've spent restoring this radio. But anyway, uh, a big thank you to her. Uh, for that and a million other things. So before we put this, case, this radio back in the case though, I would like to do an alignment on it and then maybe as a kind of closeout we might go through the circuits and talk about how the circuits work uh, and things of that sort. I'm going, to, I'm going to waffle on that one for a while and see whether that's something that people might be interested in doing because we're reaching the end of this and the series is getting pretty long. I think we're up to a total of about 17 or 18 parts, maybe 19. Of course, some of those are on the other radio. So, uh, in fact, about half of this series is on the other radio, that Waterson that we worked on to begin with. But nonetheless, this radio is now restored, safe, and ready to be aligned for peak performance and 
I hope that this has been uh, instructive to a number of people. As I have said throughout this series, this is just my way of doing it. It doesn't mean it's the only way or the right way. It just means it's a way. But uh, nonetheless, there are a lot of things that I have learned over the years from people who came before me and who do these same jobs. So I hope I've been able to pass some of that along. Uh, I do plan to make a, uh, a last segment of this uh, series with uh, doing the alignment of this radio. And uh, then I think what I'm going to do is stick it in the case and put it in my workshop. So anyway, thanks for watching. Look forward to the, to the last one in this series. And in the meantime, have a nice day.